20 seconds. Working out some last minute logistical things. Um, so thank you everybody for coming this evening. Um, we're very excited about this project, the Voices of SJC, an oral history project uh, that's been several years in the making. Um, so I wanted to give everyone a little bit of context for how this project got started and how we are, are, are all here together today. Um, maybe about three years ago, Sister Susan approached me in the lobby of McIntaggart Hall and had a brilliant idea of collecting oral histories from the sisters at the college. Um, and I thought it was a, an amazing idea, but as all good ideas go, it takes a couple of years sometimes to put them into action. Um, so with the help of Mayumi being the great motivator and best colleague uh, a librarian can ask for, um, we started to put the plan into action and um, pinpointed some of the sisters we wanted to uh, speak with, three of whom are here this evening, um, and moved the project forward with the support of Michael Burke and the Honors Program. Um, and this event was uh, motivated through support from the ACES program. As you'll see, several, the majority of the students in the um, program in the spring 2017 were ACES, our ACES students and our ACES honors students um, who we're very proud of. Uh, so we invited everybody here this evening to showcase the work that was done in the spring um, and to let you know about this project. It's going to be ongoing. We have three, um, inter we have three narrators lined up for this uh, fall semester and we have another group of nine honor students working with us. Uh, so we do hope to build the collection. Um, our, our new president, Don Boomgarden, has uh, agreed to maybe be interviewed in the, in the spring semester um, and some other um, fine faculty, staff, students, we hope that we can get everybody involved in this. Um, so, I just kind of wanted to contextualize a little bit about the exciting um, nature of oral histories and why we thought it was such a special project. So I'm going to read a little bit from my notes here. Um, so oral histories have the potential to change the way we understand history. According to the Oral History Association, oral history is a field of study and a method of gathering, preserving, and interpreting the voices and memories of people, communities, and participants in past events. Oral history is both the oldest type of historical inquiry, predating the written word and one of the most modern initiated with tape recorders in the 1940s and now using 21st century digital technologies. Mayumi and I, you'll see, haven't entirely mastered those 21st century digital technologies. There's still a hiccup here or there, and Sister Elizabeth can probably speak to um, the camera going out during her interview. But nonetheless, we've... Yeah, <laughs> no, just the right amount of time you spoke, so. Um, so we're very excited about this project. And if you like what you see here tonight, we do ask that you can keep checking in on the project as it grows. Um, and there's also several other really exciting oral history projects going in the very cool library world. Um, there's all kinds of amazing oral history projects happening. The Brooklyn Historical Society down the road has just released, um, I think, about 40 or 50 decades worth of the oral histories they've collected over the years. The New York Public Library has uh, the oral history, the community oral history project where you can walk into several of the branches there and donate your oral history. Um, and then the amazing organization called StoryCorps that travels from East Coast to West Coast uh, collecting everybody's stories. Um, and they have a, a booth which we hope to visit next spring, maybe with the students, um, where you can go in and kind of they have this amazing sound recording booth where you can record your oral history. Um, so without further ado, I just want to say a couple of extra thank yous. So thank you to Sister Susan for bringing the idea to us. Thank you to Mayumi for keeping the project going. Thank you to the ACES program who's here tonight um, supporting us and the Dean's office who helped us tremendously with this, um, as well as the sisters and the students who have participated in this. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic over now to uh, Kate and Erica uh, from the ACES program just to introduce that. And then we'll see a short 12-minute clip of the four oral history interviews. And then we're going to open it up to um, a panel discussion with three of the sisters and several students. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. It's a live mic. <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm, I'm Kate Mee, and I'm the director of the ACES program. And I'm here with Erica David, who's the assistant director of the ACES program. We're going to be very, very brief. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, for those of you, I think most everyone in the room does know this, but for those of you who don't know, um, the ACES program is incredibly special to our college. Um, it's incredibly special to Brooklyn. Um, it's incredibly unique to New York and maybe, maybe the US. I don't really know of any program that's quite like it. So. Um, I want to thank everyone who's here. We have a constellation of friends and family, ACES past and present and future, former directors, um, former staff, former students, current students. Um, and I want to thank the Dean's Office also for their participation in, in sponsoring the event, and Lauren and, and Mayumi as well. 
Um, so students in the ACES program, um, they are exceptional academic students. The one thing that they do share is that English is not a first language for them. Within our program, students from the ACES program come from over 30 different countries. Um, they hold some of the highest GPAs in our college. They attend some of the nation's best graduate programs and go out and do amazing work um, in the world. So it's a truly remarkable program um, in the history uh, of which we're really thrilled to be part of. Um, so I promised I would be brief, so I'll try to, try to wrap it up a little bit, but I want to pass to Erica. Um, so just to dovetail on that last point about them being exceptional in every way, but especially academically, um, they are often uh, make up large numbers of the honors program as well. Um, and the reason why we're here tonight is because a lot of ACES students were specifically involved through the honors program in the history project. So we're excited that we got to be here. And I just wanted to, again, reiterate and say thank you to Lauren, to Mayumi, to everyone who's here, to the sisters, Sister Margaret Buckley, Sister Mary Florence, Sister Elizabeth Hill, and to um, the young ladies who are here tonight from ACES, Dara Desrosiers. Did I say it right? No? Sort of? OK. Um, Amarfi Collado, Pamela Castillo, Susan Reyes Hernandez, and Yuseni Fernandez, and of course, Juanita Arias, who's the current student body president and also a proud ACES member. OK. Thank you for coming. I think we're going to start with a brief 12-minute um, video um, that gives you a taste of the interview process for the Oral History Project. Thanks. Ramadan with us. And it's so wonderful because it's wonderful for my education. And it's wonderful for the children because it teaches diversity, it teaches respect, it teaches love, it teaches all the things that our mission is all about love of God and love of neighbor. Are you familiar with the Corporate Yes, we're very fortunate. children for a minute. Um, it's one of the things that I just did with them. Um, we have a tree house now in our classroom that the parents built with, a, with their uh, with the grandpa, and somebody brought in fresh eggs from a farm. And so some were brown, and some were tan, and some were white. And so we looked at it. And I said to them, we looked at the colors on the outside, and I said, do you think that the brown eggs will be brown on the inside? And will the tan eggs be tan? And will the white eggs be white? Yes, yes. I said, let's find out. So we opened one at a time. And we looked and they said, now, of course, they see the brown, so they think it looks different. Now, you know that brown eggs do not look different on the inside. I said, OK. So I took them all and we scrambled them all together. And I said, until now, tell me, which is the brown one? Which is the tan one? Which is the white one? And they couldn't tell. And I said, it's just like that. We're all different on the outside, but the same on the inside. And then we painted our skin with um, skin tone paint because some child said she was white. And I said, okay, let's see if you're white. And we took a piece of paper 
and we put it next to her skin and I said, are you white? She said, no. I said, let's find out what color you are. And she turned out to be a peach. So who was a peach and who was chocolate and who was toast and who was almond? Again, to bring in that diversity, that respect for all people, but inside that count, part of the mission, but inside that count. Well, I think, I think ACES, Sister Margaret Buckley is really the authority on ACES. She was the academic dean. But and certainly I was, in a minor way, involved. She, she did all the work. Um, but we were beginning to have some students, the diversity had begun, and we had some students from other countries coming to us as 18-year-olds coming out, of, they, they had come to this country, they were going either through the uh, New York elementary school system, or some of them came in high school. I don't know in what year you came in high school. And so they came, they were bright, they were interested, a number of them from Asia, um, and a number of them from Latin America, but as they came, the problem was with their ability to keep up with the reading. It wasn't a matter of intelligence, that was clear. And so we had the students before we had the program. And as we began to see that we had 10, 15 students who needed help, and they needed it systematically from people who were prepared to give it, and our regular faculty were not prepared to help students of a second language. And so we advertised, and Sinel Brooks, 
who had been teaching for some time down in the, the community college downtown here and had worked with students who were speaking English as a second language. And she came and started the program and set it up. And then Mick Lawson came and joined her and we've had others since then. And the program continued to grow. But the students had come first and therefore the need to provide for them and to help them systematically to do well. And that's, that's what has developed the ACES program. <laughs> well, Sister Margaret has a very soft spot for the ACES program. My office in secondary education used to be right opposite the ACES Center. So I often, I became very friendly with them all. And I used to be so impressed when I would walk in and see, like, especially on Friday. Friday, which is sort of a bright day on campus, now in ACES. Because, because students, I guess, who had a lot of classes, they would come for individual one-on-one -on -one work. And I think if you're trying to improve someone's writing, one-on-one -on -one is really the best way to do it. And they also hired a number of tutors to work with them. And Mick was very fussy about <laughs> he wanted the right kind the right kind of people, you know, who would uh, have respect for the students, be reliable, work hard. And um, I think he succeeded. I should also mention that um, the husband of a, an alumna, um, a little gentleman named Mary Grace Calhoun, done a big, uh, a big donation. And that's why the center is named, her picture is hanging in there someplace, and her name is over the door, Mary Grace Calhoun Dunn. Um, so the center is named after her. But I think other other donors have contributed. I know Steve Summers, and that, another, another, he's a graduate himself, and he has uh, he's contributed to scholarships for, for AC students. Of course, it's kind of easy to uh, sell the program to benefactors because it's so clear that it's a wonderful program and really serves, serves a real need. And I think the students, the students over the years have genuinely appreciated it. Some of them have gone on to spectacular achievements, medical school, graduate school, all kinds of wonderful things because the, now they work very hard. I think my observation in there is that they work hard. Right? Yeah, they work very hard. The tutors work hard, but the students work hard too. And they do the well greatly. Oh no, because I think the course the course used to just be one year courses. And then I think they've extended it now into sophomore year. And then the tutoring I think is always available to you for four years. And so anyway I'm a big fan of the ACES program. What a wonderful video, and yes, Sister Margaret, we have to, to write uh, maybe 10,000 drafts before the professors approve our final essays. <laughs> I still don't remember that, Professor Larson. <laughs> um, so to begin uh, today, I know we can continue watching the video, uh, but what a privilege to have today face to face our sisters, graduates of the college, and voices of our college. So to begin, I would like to introduce Sister Margaret Buckley, uh, class of 1955. Sister Margaret is former academic dean, and she's trying to retire <laughs> and find a way to get involved. Sister Margaret, please take your chair. That, that picture of me with the veil, did you, did you know 
thought that was me, probably not. <laughs> Secondly, Sister Mary Florence, class of 1946. Sister Mary Florence is former Vice President of Academic Affairs. Please come to the chair. Ooh. Elizabeth Hill, class of 1964. Sister Elizabeth is former president of the college. And lastly, but not least, we have Sister Pat. Sister Pat was at the beginning of the video. Uh, Sister Pat is a teacher at the Delman Center and a professor in the Child Study Department. She's not coming from the corner. She, <laughs> she wasn't able to be here with us today. However, her presence is felt in our heart. Thank you. And now, let's give a warm welcome to our students as well. Pamela Castillo. Marfi Coljado, Dara Dorosius, Yesenia Fernandez, and Susan Reyes Fernandez. Okay, so we will be we will be giving questions. Uh, whoever will to answer, you can just uh, uh, get the, the microphone. So we'll, be, we'll begin with the sisters. How were your experiences getting interviewed by the students? <laughs> Please, Sister Margaret, Sister. <laughs> sister Margaret. Well, actually I enjoyed it. I thought I might not have anything to say, but it seems as though I did. <laughs> um, when, I, when I finished though, I said to people, um, I don't think Judy, Judy, uh, what's her name, uh, has anything to worry about. Uh, I'm not going to be taking her place as the interviewer of uh, the, the news hour. <laughs> I haven't been, no. <laughs> so it was an interesting experience. <laughs> I have been because um, sometimes they would come up to, for something about the developments in the college for the paper. So there are, you know, once in a while, but not a lot. I'm thinking. That could take a while. Would you repeat the question? Absolutely. How were the interviews, um, the interaction within, within the interviews, during the interviews, different uh, from the interaction with the students in the classroom settings? In the classroom, I was asking the questions, and they were, they were giving the answers. So this was a reverse process here, and I was hoping that I would know the answers. <laughs> I don't want to hog the mic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move to the students. Um, the students, how were your experiences interviewing the sisters? Were you nervous? <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Pamela Castillo. I'm a child study um, major and I'm also a sophomore. So as the first student um, that I was at the time, it was an amazing experience for me to get to know um, about the sisters and the history of St. Joseph's College because before that, I had um, limited knowledge about all the history and the amazing things that have been happening in the college previously. 
in my experience, I didn't feel nervous by doing the um, over history project. Instead, I feel like I was more intrigued to know more about the history, and um, that didn't make me feel nervous, but more um, just to get to know everything that the sister needed to say about the beautiful experience they had in St. Joseph's. Thank you. Also, we were working as a group. It was like 15 students, right? So we didn't feel alone. Um, at first, I was nervous because we have great respect for the sisters, and they are so knowledgeable about the history of the college, and we were not so adept at that time. So I felt like I had to research a lot. But <laughs> Lauren and Mayumi, they divided everything into modules, and it didn't feel like we had a, a work overload. Instead, it felt organic, and at the end of the day, we were prepared. And <laughs> yeah, and the, nerv the nervousism kind of went away a little bit. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dara DeRosius. I'm a psychology major, and I'm also a sophomore. Just like Pamela stated, <laughs> Sorry. Just like Pamela stated previously, it was um, an amazing feeling and it was an honor for me to uh, interview the sisters and especially going to the archive and the Founders Hall. Um, it really helped me furthering my knowledge in, and about the foundation about, of the college. So it was um, really an honor and an amazing privilege for me. in which my own name is Lauren help us and we wore gloves specifically so that we will maintain <laughs> all the documents in the um, in the most preserved form. And so it was just a very coordinated work. So a big thank you to Lauren and Miami for keeping us on track. Um, as we continue, another question for our students. What were some of the most impactful and interesting discoveries that you gained about the sisters or St. Joseph's College through the oral history project? Hello, my name is Amarfi Colado. I'm a sophomore and my major is criminal justice. I interviewed sister Marion Florence and one of the most impactful things that I learned is that, for example, um, before there wasn't the option of transferring from one college to another. And I learned that this happened as a result of a student revolution that happened during the 1960s. And this made me realize, like sometimes, we see in the news how important social, movement, social movements are, but when we kind of hear and see those social movements happen by students, it made me realize how important it is when students come together and just by coming together, they can make a change. Yeah, it, it was really impactful, that information that I obtained from Sister Mary. Thank you. Thank you. This is getting fun here. <laughs> the microphone passing around. So I'm just Agni, and I am a computer information technologist and also an art studio student at St. Joseph's College. Um, I guess mine is not like very about the sister, but something that one of the sisters told me in the research synopsis that we had earlier this year. Um, so I already knew about the library uh, building, the MCE building opening in 1965 but I didn't know that the library building was in Lorenzo. And one thing that I found very interesting is that she told me that the students were the one who carried the books from Lorenzo all the way to the library <laughs> building. So, and guess how many books we had? We had a collection of 63,000 books in the school, but we had capacity for 200,000 books, which is a lot. Now I know computers are replacing it, but we still have a lot, um, but that's something that I found very interesting. Students carrying the book, I just could imagine. I pictured that. <laughs> Thank you, Yesenia. Um, now a question for our sisters. Um, how, as a St. Joseph's College graduate, 
Please tell us a little bit about the diversity on campus when you are a student at St. Joseph's. Well, I'm the oldest, so we'll start with, <laughs> we'll start with me. Um, there was very little diversity, but keep in mind that when I started college in 1943, uh, it was unusual for women to go to college. When, when the college was founded in 1916, uh, a very, very small percentage of women attended college, and it wasn't that much greater in the 1940s. Um, add to that um, the difficulties in this country in terms of diversity at that time. So within my own uh, college class, the class of 1946, we had one black student, very good, um, and went on to do very effective things. But just as an example of the practical difficulties, we all got along, everything was fine here. But for junior week, when we were going to the theater, or we were going out to dinner, uh, she always had to do something at home because she knew that she would not be accepted in a restaurant in New York. And that went on uh, throughout the 40s. Uh, no restaurant would seat anyone other than a white student. So that had its impact much beyond <laughs> restaurants it was part of the culture, even here in New York. And New York was better, I think, than most places. We were already diversified, but highly compartmentalized. So very few, and relatively few uh, black students were Catholic at that time. So that was the second, and we were clearly a Catholic college at that time. So there were, there were two, two problems or two barriers. Um, it was unfortunate and it continued on. I mean, it did not end in the 1940s. And I think we're recognizing now we're in another period in which diversity is under attack. On the one hand, it's, it's being promoted and is understood to be vital for the country. Uh, it, it's a part of the country. And at the same time, we're seeing uh, the difficulties that people are experiencing. Thank you. Uh, well, I was here in the 50s, but I would say in terms of diversity, it hadn't changed very much from the 40s. <clears throat> there was an occasional black student. I don't remember. Um, Hispanic students, certainly not Asian students, Muslim students, not the diversity that we have today. And um, we, I think we have, we're kind of unusual today in the kind of diversity, the level of diversity we have. And I don't know if I'm a little, uh, but bit of a Pollyanna, I think we have a very um, easy relationship. Um, we get, we get along well. As you said, you made it, you, you did it as a team. You did it as a team <laughs> and that made it, you did it as a team and that made a difference, right? And so I think, um, you know, if you look at our teams today, but, uh, but in the 50s, no, it was just the same as in the 40s. I think, but that's also partly a reflection of Brooklyn. The, the demographics of Brooklyn have changed. Um, and they, it was pretty, st pretty much still. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the details of the demographics, but it, it was, you know. Hmm? Oh. Okay. Well, anyway. Ditto for the '60s, basically. Really? Well, so when did the change occur? Later. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I just want to add something to that. Brooklyn was also <laughs> Brooklyn was also different from New York City uh, in that it was compartmentalized in terms of religion. So Catholics were Catholics, 
and there was no deviating from that. And non-Catholics or Protestants were Protestants. I, I don't think you can imagine it today. You, you can't imagine what it was like that there were so many segments. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a racial issue necessarily. It was also in terms of religion and in terms of politics. So you were what you were, and you didn't deviate. <laughs> Well, also we should say, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we weren't diverse in terms of gender either. <laughs> so we, we were not very diverse at all. Thank you. How do maxims, now continuing on the topic of diversity, how do the maxims and the philosophies of the philosophy of the sisters of St. Joseph support diversity? Now, today, in the current political environment. Well, that's that's <clears throat> that's not an easy question to answer because the uh, the maxims come from 17th century France, uh, and they're rooted very much in a different culture, a, a different ideology. But I think uh, fundamentally, our charism is um, to be the congregation of the great love of God and neighbor without distinction, and that is what we aspire to be. We don't always succeed, but that is very much at the heart of our uh, our mission and our ministries. And so we try to create an environment everywhere we are of openness, of welcome, of um, embracing uh, people as they are, uh, with the hope and expectation that we will be able to encourage them to grow and to become the very best that they are meant to be. And that really, I think, is the underpinning of the St. Joseph's College philosophy, which is really rooted in the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph from 1650 France. We haven't changed much. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. Now to the students. As members of the ACES program, you have received scholarships. Um, how has the scholarship support helped you in the pursuit of your educational career? For me, for example, we can, well, for me and for every student in the ACES, we can see that um, the ACES scholarship has something which is very unique, is that you didn't have to apply for it when you were in high school. It's kind of like your counselor comes to you and she tells you, you receive this scholarship because that college recognizes that you were, that you went through all of the obstacles and that kind of gives you the, like, the first start to realize that there is help in this country to keep on um, going, to keep on um, pursuing what you want to do. And for example, if you want to go to law school, which is my, my case, and many me realize that law school, yeah, is expensive, but there are options to apply for scholarships. And that is not, it might not be only academic scholarships, like being the, having the highest GPA, sorry, having the highest GPA, there are other options to like the ASS scholarships. My experience being the first member of my family to attend college in the United States, the AC scholarship has helped me a lot to pursue my um, dream because when I arrived to this country, I didn't speak English at all or didn't understand it in any um, means. So when I started um, college, I just been in the country for three years and um, having the AC scholarship helped me to um, follow my dreams and to keep always um, learning and reminding myself that it's it is possible to become um, to come from a different country and um, have the opportunity to learn and um, yes that's what I can say that thanks to the AC's um, scholarship I'm going um, to be a future educator and um, yes. Sorry. Well, it seemed like um, a Murphy stole everything that I was gonna say. <laughs> but um, yeah, to me, the ACES scholarship is more of an indication that there is hope out there. And it is hard, and it, it will be hard, but the scholarship, it really, it's, it's sort of a support and a hope that there are people there willing to support you in any way, so. Um, the ACES scholarship is a great help because it's hard for us to start college as uh, new per people to the country, 
but also our parents are new to the country. So for like, for example, for my mother, when we came, she had to find a job, she had to find an apartment, and start from the bottom, and thinking that she had to pay 25,000 tuition wasn't easy. But then we had the scholarship, and that made things smoother and helped me a lot, and she could sleep better. <laughs> So um, when I started college in the fall of 2015, wow, time flies. Um, the St. Joseph's College opened the doors to me, not um, only with like telling me, hey, this is how much you have to pay, but they opened the door to me with this ACES scholarship that, op uh, as I, I already say it, but like it opened the door as a home, not as a school. And that's what I saw in the ACES um, Center every time I would go to tutor. I saw I, I saw a home and I still see a home there, even though I don't go so often now. But <laughs> it's, it's still my home. So um, growing up in the countryside of the Dominican Republic, um, I didn't have so much hope. I didn't have a lot of opportunities. I confronted a lot of challenges and um, financially as well. And when I came here, it was like very hard for my mom to kind of uh, just just the thought of going to college. It was hard to think that my mom was have to was gonna have to pay for school. But I still like kind of apply for uh, all different school. I applied for like 14 different college. And yeah, a lot already. <laughs> so it was like very hard. And still in college, like the AC scholarship is amazing. But this is the thing. Um, the scholarship stays the same all the time. And I still I apply for another scholarship um, last this last semester, and I I got the ACES summer scholarship, which is also another amazing scholarship connected with the ACES program. Um, I feel grateful because I've I feel like there's more hope to go, and this scholarship has helped me so much to just kind of have less on my mind of, oh, I have to pay so much loans in the future. Thank you, Sandy. Sister Margaret mentions on the video that Friday was a light day on campus, but now on ACES program, certainly, and this is still true today, ACES is in fact very active on Fridays. So in addition to contributing to the atmosphere, the welcoming environment of the college, in addition to helping us academically and economically, the ACES program helps us as well to deepen our cultural knowledge. So we are invited to go to different um, Broadway shows and different com uh, events in which we get to know each other in each other's cultures a lot more. So thank you as well to the ACES program. Now, when and where did the idea come to come from to establish the ACES program, Sister Margaret? I think um, it's pieces of that have, pieces of that have come out already. Um, I think, actually, I remember the very first idea, of, uh, Sister Mary Florence said there were students here, but a faculty member did some demographic study using the census data, and um, it, it, out of it came the idea that in Brooklyn and Queens especially were large numbers of immigrant students. And it, the idea came to us all that St. Joseph's would be a good environment for students who needed um, some support, a small, personal, um, encouraging, and um, but as Sister Mary Florence said, it also required um, skillful, uh, just good intentions would not be enough. Uh, it required people who would know how to provide what the students needed. But we also involved, as Sister Elizabeth mentioned, some alumni in the education field who were in high, sc high schools, principals, superintendents, and they were very supportive of the idea and made a lot of suggestions to us as well. As she said, that's why they, ACES stands for Academic Center, Academic Center for Enhancement Services. I think that's what the four, the four letters stand for, because we wanted to make it very clear that this was not a remedial program. 
It was a program for high, prof high potential students. Um, you know, we used to say in the old days that the, the ideal <laughs> ACE student had a 600 math SAT. This was when they had the other numbers. The, the old, I forget what they are now, but it was 600 math and a like 350 or 400 verbal. So you could see the intelligence there, but you could see the need for bringing up that those uh, verbal skills so that the student could really function at the full potential. So that's how, I think that's the essence of it. honoring Sister Elizabeth Hill, and it was truly inspiring. As president of the college and pioneering so many aspects, helping to expand the athletic department, for example, what advice will you give us so that we can succeed in our professional world? Hmm. I think uh, continue what you're doing. Um, I, we've all heard that you work hard, and I think that's probably the most important thing. And I would also say, and it's probably really, really uh, kind of basic, but I think pay attention. I think there's so much in our world today where there's a, a deluge of information that you're being constantly uh, inundated. And I think you really have to keep your eye on your goal. Uh, you have to understand yourself well enough to know uh, what your strengths are and continue to try to uh, work on them to enhance them. Recognize that you have weaknesses and don't be afraid to get help. Uh, so if you have a problem, for instance, in public speaking, well, face it and go get some help for it. Uh, if you have other issues that you are aware of, um, don't be shy about saying, well, I'm not so good at that. Um, with me, it was math. There is, I'm not good at math. But you, you know, you have to always, you always have to recognize that uh, God has given all of us a combination of strengths and weaknesses, and it's our job to take the whole person and to really work as best you can uh, to cultivate all the good goodness that's there. And the last thing I think is you have to be generous. You have to have a generous giving heart and always look for the opportunities that come up to provide for others, to give, to share, to reach out, uh, to make the world a better place. And all of that put together, paying attention, being aware of yourself and your strengths and weaknesses, and then ultimately having a generous heart and giving back, I think you'll have a wonderful life. Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. I'm writing all of these advices. <laughs> Make sure. Keep on track. Um, any last comments from our panelists before we open up to question and answer? No? Going once? Going twice? Going twice? Perfect. So we would like to open now the panel for questions that our audience may have. So um, one of the challenges of going to a commuter school is obviously feeling like a sense of community, feeling like a part of campus, part of the college. Has this experience um, helped the students to feel like more of a part of the St. Joseph's community? The ACES program has definitely helped us in so much um, different sides to help of feeling in community. For example, just being in class with ACES members, when you get out of class and you walk in the hallway and you see a former like, ACES member, you look at them and you smile and you feel like you have a person that you will see one day and you smile and you can ask that person for help. And if you have that person in the same class that you, for example, in a math class, like I'm also bad at math. Math is my worst um, subject. If I have an ACES member that I can ask, so do you do the homework? How do you feel? I can ask them for help. And ACES by just doing the events they do, like going to Broadway shows, having different events. Like for example, ACES have the ACES discussion on Fridays. Um, and there we can talk about um, difference. We can express like everything that's going on in the, with um, our immigrant community. So ACES helps in so many 
different ways. Uh, I just want to share this experience. I, well, the transition from high school to college was really not easy for me. Um, you know, I had a lot of interviews, um, college applications. It was just such a headache. But um, I remember the day that I had my interview for St. Joseph. I came with my mom and my uncle. My mom and I were really close. And so um, in front of the security guard, there was a sign that said, St. Joseph's welcomes Dara. And I looked over to my mom, and I, um, I, I felt like this was going to be different. This was just not going to be another interview. And um, when I went into the interview room, and Professor Lawson was there also, it felt as if they already knew me. It, I didn't really have to repeat what I wrote about. And so it, 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 was a, it was an amazing feeling just to know that you were already part of the community without um, giving any decision yet. So it was, it was really amazing. So I was part of a uh, summer program for high school students before I came to college. And I saw how close everybody was and how well taken care of I was in the, in the ACES program. The tutors were always like on top of me. If I didn't do good on the paper, they would make me rewrite it and say, like, and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with me, telling me what is wrong, what I have to uh, enhance and all of that and I said this is the college I w want to come to because you feel like this is family and you feel like you're taken care of and um, even for my other classes I know that some of the uh, tutors or directors of ACES email sometimes my professors asking oh, how are we doing and sometimes we have these uh, reunions and they're like oh yeah this is um, out of the blue, but no, they know that we're not, we didn't do good in one exam, and then they have a meeting with us. So, yes, they are on top of us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dika? Yes. Um, as an essay student, uh, um, knowing that English is not your first language, how does uh, how has the ACES department have uh, helped you with your other classes, knowing that you know some of you may feel insecure with your English? How has it helped you be more involved uh, during your other uh, uh, classes and also be, uh, feel more um, confident in talking in with the professor if you have any concerns? How has the ACES department helped you, uh, ACES students? Thank you, Tina. I would like to answer the question. There are many, many aspects that um, I'm very thankful for the ACES program. And since it was my second language, uh, writing essays was quite challenging at first. So simply knowing how to cite properly was a major challenge, and it, a major challenge, and it still continues to be. So as the, my partners have expressed, we have the opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one tutor, tutoring assistance in the ACES program. So I used to go constantly. And now in the, the routine, learning the habit of going to get your papers reviewed, is, it's an aspect that I still continue to, to perform. So even now, I'm, I know I'm still a senior, but I, I have to admit, I still go to the ACES academic writing center in the ACES program because I know they're very busy with our newer uh, students. But I continue to go to the academic writing center, and it's a habit that I developed since my freshman year. And like I said, Professor Larson emphasized a lot, make sure you have the right citation, make sure you have the right grammar and sentence structure, which has helped me a lot when I'm writing an email, when I'm writing a biology lab, when I'm writing a sociology lab, uh, paper. So it's really been um, very insightful, and it's provided me the tools so that I can become adapted to the college environment. That's great. Um, so basically, being an honor student at St. Joseph's College and also an ACES student, I am an honor student because I was first an ACES student. And the ACES, um, cause yeah, I started as an ACES, then my second semester I went into the honors program. Um, I don't think I would have done it without ACES because they pushed me to 
do my essays. They pushed me to go to tutoring. And everything, my writing skills had progressed significantly. And like, it's amazing how I read one of the essays I wrote in high school, and I read it now, and I was like, what, I say that? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it's, it's just amazing. I, I wouldn't believe going to the academic center now, and I do. I do go to the academic center, and I still do go to the East Center. You probably haven't seen me, but Jason has, right, Jason? <laughs> so um, it's amazing because I just have learned so much from ACES, and thanks to ACES, I, I am the person I am today because I have developed myself a lot. We also learn uh, like not to be scared. Sometimes we don't want to, myself, I don't want to speak up in class because of my English, and I think that I'm going to be judged or something. But in ACES, I learned that it doesn't matter. I have to embrace my, my, my culture, and people are going to understand that I'm just learning English, and it doesn't, like the limit is in my head, and ACES teaches you not to be scared to speak up. I don't really have a question, but I just want to thank our sisters for being here, and I'm very honored to meet you guys. I'm very, very honored, and uh, I'm very thankful to be part of the ACES program, and it really helped me a lot through my freshman and through my sophomore, as I'm sophomore right now, and I'm very, very happy meeting you guys and learning a lot from you guys. Thank you so much. So Miami's going to have a, a couple of closing remarks for us. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much again, um, everybody, to be here. And thank you, sisters, for participating in this oral history project. And then thank you, Juanita, for moderating this panel discussion. I think she did a great job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, all the student panelists, I'm sure it was your first time to be in the panel, right? Yeah, but you guys rock. So um, as much as um, you feel grateful to be part of ACES, um, I think St. Joseph is lucky to have you guys here. Yes. And Lauren and I plan to continue um, with this oral history project. And we have a nice web page set up. So please check back. And we have a full version of the videos online. And we have additional um, sisters gave us a tour of the Founder Hall, Founder Hall uh, when we did the interview. And we just finished editing those, the very casual walking tour of the Founder Hall. And so please check back, and we hope to add more videos. We see a couple of uh, spring, I mean fall 2017 oral historians here. So good to be, uh, good to have you here. So please check back, and thank you so much, everyone, to be here tonight with us. And we have refreshment left. We have rooms until 6.30, so please hang around. Thank you. Thank you.